Hey everybody, it's John Reed, Diginomica. How you doing? Uh, yes, this is indeed a, a solo flight show for now, though I may have a special guest coming later, so don't despair <laughs> if you're looking for a little more variety than just me talking to you. But uh, actually, I do really want to talk a little bit about this legacy SaaS concept under development that I've had going for a while, uh, because I don't think it got properly developed in the other show that I did. I think it's important. Um, but before I do, uh, yes, I have some cool guests coming in the future weeks here. I got a little more work to do lining them up. My mom was in town this week. First time I saw her since prior pandemics. So that interfered with my uh, show guest preparation this week. So that's why you're stuck just looking at me. Uh, but feel free to comment in the stream as usual because I will be getting a conversation going there. And just be forewarned, if you comment, I'm going to pull you in. So beware. Uh, anyway, let me talk to you a little bit. Oh, one more thing. I'm going to ban two other buzzwords from my show today. So uh, right now, officially, the only banned word is uh, blockchain, but there's going to be two more added. So uh, <laughs> that'll be your reward for sticking out on the <laughs> sticking through the legacy SaaS conversation with me here. Uh, so let me just briefly kind of tell you how this whole thing evolved. Um, when I when I developed this sort of legacy SaaS concept, basically the idea was I wanted to figure out a way to kind of pick on some of the industry darlings. I hang out with a lot of analysts and stuff, and there's certain uh, vendors that really don't get a whole lot of uh, criticism thrown at them, and they're kind of viewed as um, having brought the business of enterprise software to a much much better place than it was before. And I think that's fair. And I and I and I didn't when I developed this legacy SaaS idea, it wasn't to really pick on a particular vendor. Though I think if you do some searching for the term, you'll see that at least a couple marketing teams picked up on this and used it to bash one vendor or another. That wasn't really what I was going for there. Um, really what the whole concept of legacy SaaS was about in the first place was more the message that the cloud business transformation sort of promised by SaaS is essentially incomplete. And I'm not sure if it's going to get there unless we become more vocal about what the shortcomings are. And so my argument there was that some SaaS vendors are running the risk of perhaps becoming legacy players as vendors that kind of do get the possibilities here come along. And I certainly see some of them operating in the small and mid market. They have not yet necessarily penetrated the large enterprise marketplace in the same way yet. But anyhow, and several of the ones I like the best are Diginomica partners. So that puts me in a little bit of a tricky spot because I don't want this to turn into a promotional campaign for a handful of vendors. So I'm not going to really mention them because that's not the point. Um, anyway, Brian and I, Brian Summer, who's my frequent video partner and sparring guest on the show, uh, had uh, a special blowout uh, a few uh, weeks ago on Legacy SaaS, which was fun. Brian prepared a bunch of slides, and you can catch that replay on YouTube at uh, Jonathan W. Reed. And it also, I'll, I'll paste that into the chat just in case you want to see it. And also, um, there are audio versions of it too. So if you prefer that, just hit me up. But there you will find the video replays. And you may find that conversation with Brian interesting. But one of the things I realized after I finished my discussion with Brian on this is that I think Brian and I are coming at this from slightly different angles because I think Brian is a little bit loath to, uh, in my interpretation, to bring the hammer down on some of the, the newer vendors because Brian is a little bit more preoccupied with a lot of the so-called real legacy vendors, particularly legacy ERP vendors that uh, that he thinks are really essentially exploiting customers. And so uh, I think, you know, he and I are kind of coming at it differently. And I, I'm not saying that those vendors deserve a, a pass here. I'm just sort of kind of shifting focus a little bit for this legacy SaaS concept to kind of explain why I think this hasn't gone far enough. And sort of at the core of, of my view is this is basically a concept that I'm still developing. So that's why I haven't actually written about it yet. Um, part of it too, and the reason it's a little bit awkward is that I think <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, sort of pandemic gratitude that needs to be paid to a lot of software vendors out there. And I think a lot of 
a lot of SaaS vendors really proved their their merits and values to customers during the pandemic and had really terrific pandemic responses uh, when when people needed them most. And so, you know, I meant I meant this to be somewhat of a lighthearted conversation in some ways because <laughs> I did really want to acknowledge that a lot of these vendors have really come through in the last year or two when they were needed most. And and companies that were working already on these vendors' products had smoother remote transitions, and those who didn't were able to pull it off. and And we there was kind of a rallying point around that. And so I don't really want to take away from that, uh, but I did want to light a fire um, to kind of raise some more intense questions about the so-called SaaS value proposition. And that's sort of the point. Um, you know, the obsession of the show is really to figure out why we have so many underperforming enterprise projects and you know why why we can't see a better result and so uh so my argument here is that we gave SaaS vendors a bit of a pass for a while and why, why did we do that well we did it because the user experience first of all was so much better than the sort of super user oriented uh classic you know green screen gooey evolution of the classic enterprise software uh, OPEX was easier for budgeting. Implementations were faster. The ratio of consulting to software versus implementation wasn't insane. I mean, in many cases, you're talking about going from like 10 to 1 ratios for on-premise or higher down to 2 to 1 or even 1 to 1 or less. Uh, absorbing new functionality every quarter, six months was generally a lot better. And granted, uh, you know, it's not always easy to absorb functionality every every quarter or six months, but it's it's a huge improvement and customers can eventually figure out how to do it. Uh, and yes, integration seemed a bit easier. SaaS vendors tended to have better APIs. Workflow automation was generally better. Uh, also, they tended, to, they tended to audit your software less. And we wanted to recognize that these vendors provided real economies of scale uh, via multi-tenant architectures versus uh, what you might call the sort of faux cloud the cl uh, of hosted solution in your uncle uh, in your uncle's closet, <laughs> which turned out to be problematic and created expensive uh, faux cloud data silos and made it difficult to talk about things like machine learning and and analytics and and integrating workflows. So, for all those reasons, I think uh, SaaS vendors have gotten like something of of a pass, and uh, you know those are pretty good reasons. So. <laughs> So I think when you think about that as a, as a list, you kind of realize like, yeah, that's that's why a lot of these vendors don't don't get a whole lot of criticism historically. Um, but um, you know, one day I think customers woke up and realized that they were still locked in. And uh, now, look, lock in is not always a bad thing. <laughs> You've heard me say maybe before that like marriages are also a form of lock in. So. You know, sometimes there's a lock-in by choice, but in general, I think customers realized they were more locked in than they wanted. And if you saw my uh, recent show with Upper Edges, Adam Mansfield, he, you know, he spends all day long working with customers around these, you know, SaaS vendors and contract negotiations. And really those contract negotiations, as you hear him talk about it, aren't all that different than the contract negotiations that folks were tied up in before with on-premise vendors. And so, you know, I think at the heart of my whole critique here around legacy SaaS is this idea that, that the so-called cloud, it, it should not be a UX and software delivery uh, revolution. It should be a shift in how companies do business. And, and that's where we're getting hung up. Um, SaaS software was harder to integrate than vendors let on, especially companies that wanted to tie together a number of SaaS best, best, best of breed components. And you know what? It wasn't all that cheap in the final accounting either. And uh, the feeling of lock-in wasn't terrific. And when you crunch the numbers, if you really do that crunching and did a little bit of that talking with Adam, um, not necessarily as cheap when you look at the multi-year expense. It's a different type of uh, budget line item, but it's not necessarily cheaper. So the overriding lesson is that cloud is not just an economy of scale architecture. It's not just a better user experience. It should be a better way of doing business. Uh, what I call the customer-focused uh, way of doing business for the software industry, and that's why we're not there yet. 
So anyhow, a couple of years ago at, at a Freshworks analyst event, I put kudos out to Alan Berkson of Freshworks for sparking these conversations uh, at that time. Uh, I kind of brought up this notion of legacy SaaS and, and those of us gathered in the room started kicking it around and, and developing it a little bit. And that's kind of where this whole thing started. It, it kind of stuck with me more as a warning, as a series of questions customers should be asking and, and as an opportunity. So what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is kind of walk you through what I consider the, the uh, characteristics of, uh, of legacy SaaS and what I consider the characteristics of what you might call proper SaaS or whatever, however you want to phrase it, what, what software should really look like in the modern age or just how customers should be treated. Um, we have a comment from LinkedIn user. Hey, LinkedIn user, I know who you are. You're not anonymous to me. Uh, SaaS providers are further along the internet evolution of IT than the premise bound providers. Absolutely. And they deserve a lot of credit for that. And for the most part, I think they get a lot of credit for that. So I'm just being a little bit contrarian here because I want I want to attempt to kind of sharpen thinking around this this topic and kind of essentially uh, light fires to push these these uh, evolutions of business further, right? So it's not it's not meant to to criticize these vendors because they're clearly offering a better value proposition than classic legacy software um, from a, for a variety of reasons, um, including. Uh, you know, one that I did not mention in that list that you kind of bring up here, which is sort of moving away from IT centric approaches and IT bottlenecks into uh, an era where business users have a lot more ability to control their own experience and their own sort of software and workplace productivity, their own, <laughs> their own work destiny, if you will. Um, so um, one thing that I've been thinking about around this legacy SaaS comp says is a lot of these customer success programs that, that a lot of these vendors are offering, I think are not where they need to be yet. It's customer success should not be a code word for expanding your software put, footprint, which is something I stole from uh, Josh Greenbaum, actually, who I've talked with about some of these ideas. Uh, customer success, what it really should be about is taking the collective data you're receiving from your customers and aggregating it in ways that are private and that those customers opted into and returning it back to them in the form of intel, so-called intelligent actions that they can be taking. Um, it's about helping customers achieve more advanced benefits from, from your software, many of which aren't available just because you, you took them live. And so one of the big themes of my, my show, uh, and I'm going to make a note of this on my screen or forward, is that the post-go-live benefits are the most important ones, and oftentimes they are not actually uh, achieved at go live. And so vendors need to continue to work with customers to expand on those benefits and, and, and to their credit, there's some software vendors I talk with that are really determined to do that and recognize this issue. Uh, but, uh, but I, I think we need to really expand this notion of customer success instead of falling into what I think is a very narrow kind of definition that's in practice. It's really feels more like upselling, which I think is just a very, very disappointing way of reframing that what customer success really is is every interaction with your vendor if your support sucks if you if you're giving out bad satisfaction scores how can you talk about being a cx SaaS solution or what if you're a cx vendor that inflicts pain during contract negotiations that's not true cx uh, so so that's one of the characteristics i think also the thing we have to be a little bit careful about is uh you know, this notion of vertical solutions. So the next sort of evolution in the SaaS software market is much more verticalized products, more industry specific products. But one of the things I kind of noted in my write up on this in my own notes was the dangers of that kind of, we have that vertical as if, you know, you built out a little bit of software functionality. So now you have a vertical. Well, a real vertical if you want to call it that, is a community of experts, advisors, industry leaders, deep software configuration around that industry, partners that are building and helping customers to build out functionality and apps in that industry. It's not a simple thing to build out of Oracle. And, you know, companies are talking lazily about industry clouds now, a lot of these SaaS vendors. And, and I, don't, I don't think that's right. I, I think that, you know, in my mind, I, I consider that legacy SaaS now, here's one point that Brian Summer and I definitely agreed upon, and we included it in our presentation on this topic. It's not just APIs. 
uh, I, my uh, occasional video partner in, in crime, Brian Summer, called this APIs that go nowhere. It, so, so it's about assuming responsibility for your most important integrations, and that includes even to your competitors. And you know, when I think back to when I used to go to shows, and by the way, I'm going going to be going to some shows this fall. So, like a lot of people, I'm going to be back on the road a bit. But when I think think through the years of kind of doing this, I think I think I've only seen one keynote where where a vendor actively proactively showed off an integration to a a competitor SaaS product that they knew their customers liked, even though they had similar functionality uh, in their own software. I've only seen that one time, um, and and yet customers expect that. Customers want that. So to me that's kind of falling short on the promise of what true cloud business and cloud software should be like, should be about, because it should be about customer choice. The next I kind of alluded to earlier, but it streamlined contracts and transparent pricing, simplifying software contracts, simplifying negotiations. Gartner's Hank Barnes has a bunch of data on this. Uh, so I'm not just making this up, but customers are now judging vendors by all their interactions. And this is one of these really important sort of apparent contradictions in our marketplace, uh, you know, because the thing is that that when you when you step back at it and you look at okay, buyers are more informed than ever, and and the B two B buyer, I'm I'm actually working on on an ebook on this, which Digital Market calls a D book, but anyway, hopefully someday it'll get done. But basically, the the notion behind it being that you have this informed buyer. It takes a lot more independent route towards software decisions and does a lot of online research uh, and has a pretty good BS filter a lot of the time, doesn't put up with a lot of marketing bullshit. Um, but the thing is, that same buyer, when they do you know, start interacting with vendors and creating a short list, what, what Hank Barnes at Gardner has found, and I've talked with them about this as well, is, is that the, their perception of their interactions with those software companies becomes a really, really important thing. And so... You then become judged by the totality of the the experience of working with with a vendor, and so um, so so when you think about real cloud business, that that starts at the first points of contact around sales and and demos, and you're going to get judged by that, and you're going to get judged all the way through support, and your support experience is going to is going to affect your renewal or any upselling that the vendor attempts to do. So essentially, it it all becomes this. The cyclical process of trying to serve the customer better, and if you fall short, hopefully you're going to get called out, and and that's kind of what I mean around this this uh, notion of of avoiding a legacy approach to to uh, working with customers, and I think a lot of sales approaches, unfortunately, are still uh, pretty legacy. <laughs> I have a, a comment here um, around uh, my API tweet, which took on a life of its own. Yeah. That that one kind of that was cool. That was like a old school uh, Twitter conversation that kind of took off around. I went on a rant, but I can't spoil that rant yet because it ties into one of the banned words that I'm going to announce on the show when I'm done with my uh, legacy software, <laughs> legacy SaaS uh, overview here, so which which I'm getting close on finishing up. But I want to get to the last points. Um, so uh, the next piece of it is. What about consumption-based pricing? What about easy user license transfers for casual users? What about all-you-can-eat pricing? What about easily downgrading your licenses if you're having a seasonal fluctuation? This was a big issue in the pandemic because uh, a lot of companies needed to con contract for a period of time, and a lot of their SaaS vendors weren't able to accommodate that, even if they were you know, not trying to gouge them. They simply didn't have a licensing program that accommodated that. Uh, the vendors that did uh, were able to come through for customers in a, in a different kind of way. Um, so where is the pricing innovation in, in software? We certainly see it on the cloud side. We see it on the infrastructure as a service side. We see all kinds of all-you-can-eat and consumption-based pricing models coming out of the cloud infrastructure providers. So why aren't we seeing it on the software side? Now, now I, I do know that you know, you know, there's, you know, and, and there's outcome-based pricing is a whole nother thing you could throw in there too, right? Like, why don't we see more uh, software companies willing to put skin in the game and and back up pricing based on outcome? 
And, you know, to be fair, some of these concepts have been floating in our industry for a long time. And I do know in terms of consumption-based pricing that when I bring that up with customers, not every customer is comfortable with that or wants consumption-based enterprise software pricing because they they like having a more of a predictable model. So it's not like that would work for everyone. But it is really surprising and I think disappointing how few SaaS vendors uh, in the large enterprise space have uh, flexible and creative approaches to user licensing that give more flexibility for customers. As I said, when you get into the small and medium-sized market, you get into some very interesting pricing models. And there I will call out a couple of names uh, with with Acumatica, Cloud ERP, which has some very interesting bundle licensing, Zoho, which has some very interesting all-you-can-eat approaches to, uh, to a Zoho One uh, enterprise product. And so, you know, there are vendors that are that are pushing the enterprise software pricing envelope, but as yet, we have not seen that come up market, nor have we seen a lot of the bigger uh, so-called cloud vendors, uh, you know, undertake any any creative uh, pricing um, pursuits at scale. Now, we certainly have seen that in some areas, especially around platform products, dipping toes in the water. Uh, but there, there really isn't a whole lot of pressure on these vendors to do that, and so. That's why we're here today, folks, is because we're trying to articulate a little bit of what that pressure might look like if if I could succeed in generating enough conversations around this going forward. Um, let's see what uh, LinkedIn user has to say. Digital, Cypher, Cyber are still valid labels for SaaS. Don't ban them just yet. No, those are not going to get banned. Those terms are not getting banned, so you're all good. Iris, yep, we... Pillar offer a pure consumption model. The platform use and development is free. Training is free. Like I said, in in the in, in this in the non moving aside from the large enterprise software vendors, there is some of this type of innovation going on, and that's kind of I read the whole point of what I'm talking about today is that that I think what so you say where is this pressure going to come from? I mean, I was kind of hoping it was going to come from the user groups of the larger vendors who would sort of speak up and say, look, we feel locked in. We feel overpriced. We don't feel like you're innovating on your pricing model as well as you can. Unfortunately, the user groups just haven't been, in general, that vocal about this as a whole. Um, and and I think one of the reasons for that, of course, is that most of them are fairly happy with the software because for all the reasons I went into in the beginning of this broadcast, why there's so many advantages. Um, but uh, to the point of this comment, which I'll put up on the screen one more time, uh, there are up and coming vendors who are disrupting by offering more creative pricing models. And I think as they get more traction, either in the mid market or as more niche or enterprise products and they grow, um, they will become larger vendors. And that may be the wake up call that ultimately gets these large SaaS vendors off of their, off of their behinds. Um, so, I'm all for pressure wherever that pressure comes from. If it comes from, um, you know, the market and more creative software companies, uh, that's great. But uh, I think it needs to come from a lot of different places, including those who claim to advocate for customers, which is why I'm doing this right now, trying to articulate what that would mean. So, uh, I think that that was really the the big uh, sort of outline of of the concepts I wanted to throw out at you today. I was kind of thinking of legacy SaaS as a cautionary tale. Um, I think Brian Summer, when I talked with him first about it, he 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 thought of it as kind of a vendor health check. Uh, like a lot of these vendors started out young and fit and athletic, but as you get old got older, you maybe fell into some unhealthy habits or missed out on opportunities to keep yourself sort of fit and in shape. And and perhaps that's true because I think that some of these vendors that are more legacy, there's nothing inherently uh, flawed in, in how they do business that could not be changed if they were motivated to do so. I, I would just hope that they get motivated before uh, the wake-up call comes uh, and, and before customers have to wait you know, multiple years for, for these changes to happen. But once again, I, I really didn't want to call out any specific vendors. I think a lot of you can probably think of some of the ones I'm talking about here. Uh, but but the underlying message is, is is that the cloud business transformation is incomplete, and and while I think 
a lot of these SaaS vendors you you think of that are household names now are are providing great services. They're not there yet, and and we need to hold their feet to the fire a little bit. And they do, I believe, run the risk of becoming legacy SaaS as more compelling vendors come along. So that's that's my take on legacy SaaS at this time. <laughs> so you know, I, I hope you found that interesting. And obviously, one of the reasons I recorded this is because I plan to to write about it and. You know, yeah, it is incumbents versus challengers. Um, but I'm I like I said, I'm I'm actually hoping that the pressure comes from other places as well. Um, you know, I mean there's there's all kinds of ways that pressure can be inflicted upon upon vendors to to do better. But um, you know, one of the obviously big blind spots here is we become sort of uh, blind to our own weak spots as we become more successful and we wrap ourselves around the mythology that we're doing great work and then we can't see through that mythology. So anyway, maybe, maybe with enough of this kind of conversation, we can. You know, I just have found myself in a lot of analyst briefings with a lot of uh, analysts who I feel are not pushing this issue as much as they should with with vendors so some of them are and there's some really good ones out there and the good ones are going to be on my show coming up so you will you'll meet them and some of them you already know so there's some really good ones out there too but i just i don't feel i feel it's a little too collegial with some of these SaaS darling vendors and you know and, and it's really easy to beat up on the the legacy erp companies and look they all have a lot of problems so it's it's not hard to point fingers at them, but uh, but I think we have to point fingers at pretty much every software company until until we see the these uh, promise of sort of better experiences for customers come to fruition. Um, now, as for the ban word, so <laughs> as you all know, I, I ban the word. I, I don't have many banned words on this show because you know. People can kind of say what the hell they want, but uh, I have banned blockchain. It's kind of a little bit tongue in cheek uh, because I actually don't really have a problem with with blockchain. Um, and actually, you know, I, I remain intellectually curious about what the use cases are. I just don't like it being discussed on this show because my focus is on proof points and use cases, and there just aren't any live production blockchain use cases to talk about in the enterprise right now. So. I get very impatient with 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 the hype around it, um, so that's the reason that it's like kind of banned. But I'm I'm banning two more words today, um, and Bonnie is back. Bonnie Duncan Tender, she was awesome last week. If you missed Bonnie on my show, I have a hunch she will be a regular guest when I can charm her into returning, if if I can indeed do such a thing. <laughs> Bonnie says I always find that term hybrid interesting it allows the vendor to play both sides cloud and legacy yeah and look i mean i i don't i don't have a problem necessarily with with vendors that that do that too uh you know it it's a really interesting thing as far as you you want to serve customers where they're at also and i really don't have a problem with that and i think you could you can also serve on-premise customers in a more you know, sort of modern forward thinking way as well. There's no reason why that, that can't happen. Um, and, and, and obviously a lot of, uh, a lot of vendors are figuring out how to serve their on-premise customers with more cloud-like contracts and stuff. Um, so, you know, and, and more API driven architectures. And so they're learning some things from the SaaS side of things as well. So I don't really have a problem with, with hybrid per se. What I what I have a problem with is the use of the word cloud as if as if the business transformation is complete, and and vendors I think are really disingenuous about that in how they use the term. Um, so the banned words. Uh, some of you may have seen on Twitter that I made a ruckus around seamless integration this week, and if you do, if you do a, a search on my Twitter feed, you'll see that there was a lot of reaction to it, and there was actually some really good. Um, stuff as well that people kind of contributed around their different approaches to integration. And some people sort of um, cheerfully argued with me a little bit, uh, calling attention to different approaches and making sure that I wasn't being too dismissive of, of things like APIs and, and such. But um, anyhow, I'm, I'm looking for the tweet, but it seems to have um, 
gotten buried in my feed, but I am, I am banning um, seamless, seamless integration on, on my show as a, as, as a buzzword. You're not allowed to say that, that you have seamless integration or that you use seamless integration. It's uh, essentially a, a huge disservice to what I call the, uh, the discipline and, and rigor that I, and, and human intervention that I think is needed to make uh, good integration a reality. I've just been hearing this phrase seamless integration a lot in various keynotes. Um, and I, I just don't, I just don't want to hear it anymore. So just stop it with a seamless integration. Better integration is fine. <laughs> Actually, today on my Twitter feed, I agreed to the phrase low friction integration as an alternative for people who are pursuing uh, more self-service approaches that, that are easier for, on customers. Uh, low friction is fine. No friction is unacceptable, which is the same as seamless. Seamless integration is a fantasy. Uh, let's see. Uh, Brian wants me to ban some more words. Absolutely non-fungible tokens. Brian, I don't think I need to ban those two words because they just don't come up enough. Non-fungible tokens. Actually, you know, one word I'm on the verge of banning is another blockchain associated word, immutable. Just never claim to me that that something is immutable. Just just stop it. Stop it. Um, headless. Uh, um, I'm going to keep headless. I got to think about headless, Brian, because actually I think uh, headless is actually... I'd like to hear what you have to say about this, Brian. If if you're on, if you want to hop on cam, let me know because I'm um, ha happy to talk through this with you. Uh, I'd like to know what your alternative for headless would be because I think headless actually uh, serves is a fairly useful description of a certain approach to UX. But maybe there's a better word for it. Paradigm is just, is a is a just a dumb word, but I just don't think many people use it anymore. Uh, but if people start using it on my show, I probably would have to formally ban it um, but I don't really want to ban a whole lot of words uh, oh here's here's the latest branch of my my tweet thank you although I don't think people can easily click on that but at least they can do it in the chat um, nfts are fine yeah you know I'm not gonna ban a word like nfts I mean it's, it's a problematic concept nfts but I, I'm still holding out actually a little bit of hope that that nfts might actually be be useful to certain digital artists trying to protect their copyright, but that's another, that's not an enterprise conversation anyhow. So, so I'm banning seamless integration uh, along with blockchain. And here comes the other word I'm going to ban. I'm banning the word ecosystem. Sorry, people. I'm banning it. Now it's an interesting thing because some people have told me that and they've made a pretty good case that there's a difference between community and ecosystem. So if I ban ecosystem, well, what, what other word do you use? And community is maybe a little fuzzier and not an accurate portrayal of what goes on. The problem I have with ecosystem is that in the ecological context, it's about essentially a perfectly functioning, self-regulating system that constantly harmonizes it itself in accordance with sort of certain natural laws of regeneration, right? And I could probably look up a definition of it and get a slightly more precise one. What vendor has that kind of ecosystem? Come on, man. Vendor ecosystems are about one big fish calling the shots and always threatening to swallow up, devour, eat, eat the IP, help themselves to the projects of the smaller fish in that ecosystem. And I'm sorry, but for every one person that uses the word ecosystem responsibly in a software concept, in a software context, 99% of the marketing hacks are using it in a way that makes me want to vomit and i just want you to just stop saying the word ecosystem because i don't i just don't i don't think it's accurate i don't think i don't think vendors have ecosystems look up a definition of what an ecosystem is and tell me that that's actually what exists in the software world 
No, no, it's it's not an ecosystem. It's more of a like a uh, I don't know a a horror movie. Um, maybe it's the so- maybe it's a solar system like where the where the vendor is the sun, and we're all like hoping that the sun doesn't burn out. Uh, it kind of fits the, the animal kingdom. Big fish eat small fish. Not, I don't know, not, not, not exactly because like, like take, take a, take a top predator in, in an animal ecosystem that the top predator doesn't get to dictate the terms of how everyone else lives necessarily. Uh, it, it's just not the case, you know, e- ecosystems in, in the wild are, are thriving in various ways and the top predator in an ecosystem doesn't define how the rest of the ecosystem gets to operate. It just doesn't. Um, Bonnie says the part of ecosystem folks that vendors are not going to be happy. Well, I think Bonnie, first of all, I don't think they're list, going to listen to me and, you know, they're going to continue to use the word. So it's the fact that I'm banning it on my show. Is it going to really affect <laughs> their marketing literature? They're not going to go redo their PowerPoints as a result of, of this. Uh, but, uh, but on my show, I'm going to call you out. If you use the, use that word, I, I'm actually looking up the definition right now. Cause I want to, I should have done this before the show. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm trying to think of what will be a really good alternative to ecosystem. I'll probably have to offer people, right? If I ban it, I've got to give them something else they can use. Um, in some cases, I think community is an alternative. Uh, but I think it's really more kind of like, um, what's that Depeche Mode song? Let's play master and serve it. Maybe that's a better way of just, no, I'm sorry. I'm just kidding about that. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think, I think, I'm thinking maybe solar system could, could work better with the vendor is the sun, you know, and the closer you are to the sun, the nicer it is until you get too close and then you get burned up all alternately acquired. Uh, you know, so I, th- I think maybe I'll propose solar, solar system. Uh, we are with you, John, there's corporate planets and we know better. Yeah, we do. I'm just, the word is just used so carelessly is all. And it really, really bothers me. Um, biodiversity, right? Ecosystems have to have a certain level of biodiversity. You know, why do we not see that in our vendor ecosystems? I really don't think we do. So I think ecosystem is purely an aspirational concept right now in, in the vendor world. Vendor as center is a vendor focused perspective, not a customer focus. Well, that's right, Alan. Funny you should say that. Uh, but I, th- I think ecosystem, though, is a disingenuous way to, to present even, even a customer-centric viewpoint. Because even a customer-centric viewpoint, the, the dominant vendor in that ecosystem is, is still dictating a lot of the terms and still dictating the platform. That's, that's not the case in the wild. That's not how the word ecosystem evolved. That's not what it means. So, uh, so you know, I, I think we need to come up with a different term. And, and I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to come up with a better approach. Um, but, you know, I, I think, I think it's a customer focused perspective is absolutely a wonderful thing. I don't think saying the word ecosystem makes you customer focused though. I think it means you're, um, blandly reciting buzzwords that, that sound good, but don't mean anything. So I I don't think that's useful. So that's why I'm banning the word. So I'm not going to ban a lot of buzzwords in this group but I'm going to make fun of some of them, but I'm only going to ban a few. So I'm banning ecosystem Allen because it's being used and abused by a lot of vendors that, that don't have a customer focused perspective. Sorry. They just don't. So hopefully that will wake a few people up and make them think about like, well, what, what is this? Why, why can't I say this word? Why, why not? Well, let's, let's trace it back and see what it actually means. I, I remember I had a, a friend once he had a an aquarium that was this guy was like an 
absolute genius. He, 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 he like barely could hold down a job, but he had an aquarium. Like it was like basically the size of like my sofa. It was huge. And it was a self-sustaining ecosystem. Like everything, he didn't even have to clean it. That's how well he designed it. Like most aquariums, you have to clean it or all your fish die. Not this one. Everything was self-sustaining within that aquarium. It all just worked. And um, no one no one was in charge. I mean, well, obviously he was in a sense. He was sort of the God, the silent God that sort of occasionally pruned it. But once he set it up, kind of just let it run. It was like brilliant. And I was like, yeah, that's a true ecosystem. It just maintained itself. There was no dominant player raising pricing or, you know, promising people product with vague roadmaps and um, making promises about vendors that were going to deliver certain implementation methodologies that didn't or got low quality scores, but weren't banned from, it still got a, this still got a vendor award at the end of the year, you know, as part of the ecosystem and thank you for your leadership and all that crap. So anyway, but Hey, Alan, you know, if you want to use the word ecosystem, it's okay. I'll, I'll let you use it. But uh, in general, I just don't want it. Don't want to hear it. I, I have to hear it enough in all these virtual keynotes. I just don't want to hear it on my show. I think that's fair, right? It's my show. So, <laughs> uh, what was the bottom feeding species? I'll I'll have to get back to you on that, like next week, because I can't remember all the different things he had in there. It's been a number of years. It was pretty incredible. I wish I had a picture of it. Uh, <laughs> Alan says, "I don't." Alan, you don't use that word. If you don't, that's that's great. That's, I, I I'll, I'll come up with a better alternative for it at some point so we can describe it. But Brian, you went away, man. You were gonna explain explain why what the alternative to headless is because I think this is a. Oh, Alan was agreeing with me. Nice, excellent, Alan, excellent. Well, if if I, if you have my back, Alan, that may, that's very very encouraging for me. Uh, that means I'm definitely on the right track here. Uh, Brian, did you go away? I wanted to hear your um, recommendation. Brian had a few words he wanted wanted me to ban. Um, I mean, there, there's obviously certain things you could kind of easily ban, like low hanging fruit and stuff like that. Um, you know, paradigm, for example, is is the low hanging fruit of enterprise buzzwords. Probably, I wanted to hear about headless though, because I don't really like the word headless, but headless does seem to explain adequately you know, kind of a, an adaptable uh, environment that could, you know, a UX, transferable UX component, I guess you could say. Is there a better better word for headless architecture? Brian, are you out there? If so, let's let's hear it. Alan, what do you use? You use headless? I, I don't really use the term that much, but I guess I don't know what I would use as an alternative. So I don't think you can ban something unless there's some alternative term. <laughs> but as I think about the the ecosystem thing, I don't think I can get people to call it their solar system. I think that <laughs> I don't think that people are going to accept that as a substitute. So I'm going to have to come up with something else because they're going to be like, oh, that, that sucks. Brian says, um... <laughs> Instead of headless architecture, let's use sleepy hollow architecture. Okay. Um, Brian, I'm going to have to think about that, man. I'm not sure that's going to cut it. <laughs> Alan says, uh, I live near sleepy hollow. So headless is for horsemen. Um, and then we have headless is serverless, serverless and zero client. Right. Um, I think we understand what headless means, but is there an alternative? Because uh, Brian Reitz is a good point. I think it's kind of an annoying term. It's just, I think, unlike some other buzzwords, it actually does have a precise definition, which is sort of useful. So it's a little harder to replace, but uh, sleepy hollow architecture. <laughs> that might catch on, Brian. You should trademark that, man. Solar is too nice for what's happening in tech biz. I don't know, dude, spend a little time on Mars and decide if you like the solar system very much. Experience a little bit of those radioactive waves. You, you might, you might find that, uh, that actually it's a pretty good analogy because, uh, there's only one place in the solar system 
that that is able to sustain life, and that's a fairly fragile place as it is. The solar system is actually pretty hostile environment for the most part. You got to catch up on your Netflix documentaries. Alan says community is better. Yeah, I mean, I I like community. Uh, Alan, I've had a couple people um, try to explain to me that that it's a little bit different term in some ways, but I, you know, I guess I do, I would probably use that sometimes as an alternative. Uh, you know, I, I think in some ways community is also aspirational, but I, I like it better. And, uh, and I think it does make sense. I think there are times where, where people use ecosystem. They want to talk a little more about like network businesses that kind of are working towards the same goal. I think sometimes in a community, you can have people that aren't really a part of all of that so much. Like I kind of consider myself kind of a part of certain vendor communities, but I don't know if I really actively contribute to a so-called ecosystem. So anyway, but I'm, I'm happy with community. If I'm a customer, can I be in that many ecosystems at once? Probably not too many. Probably not, but in the so-called best of breed world, you could certainly get, be a part of a number of them. Um, but yeah, maybe that's a violation of the scientific definition of ecosystems also. So community of interest has already been used. Yeah, I mean, Thomas uh, Liebernate, who's been on the show before, feels has, has given this a lot of thought. He's actually blogged about ecosystems, so he could give us a little bit of a primer on some of that. Yeah. There's network. I mean, I don't know. Network isn't quite it either, but there, there's something there. So, uh, that's about it. Anyone have any other words they want me to consider, uh, banning? <laughs> Otherwise I'll wrap up in just a few minutes and, uh, catch you next time. I'm not sure who's going to be on next week, but I have a few, a few people in the hopper. So, just haven't confirmed someone from next Friday, but there'll definitely be someone in the chair. I'm not going to do another solo flight for a little while. Solo flights are going to be pretty rare. They just, I just felt like doing it today because I had some legacy SaaS content for you. So any other band words? I'm, I know I'm missing a good one. I'm going to check real quick. Let's see worst tech buzzwords. Twenty bullshit buzzwords that should be banned from tech forever. Let's have a look at a few of those. Game changer. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Alignment pivot. I really don't like pivot. I'm not necessarily going to ban it, but that is a pretty bad one. Low hanging fruits on this list. Circle back. I mean, circle back is dorky, but I don't know if I'll ban it. Bandwidth, take it offline. I mean, those are pretty dumb. Rockstar Ninja, Wizard. Yeah. I mean, Ninja looks really dumb, like on your LinkedIn profile. That's for sure. I don't think there's anything really bannable on that list. It's just, like you just don't want to use those words in everyday interactions, but ah, I, I just looked up this thing, 10 annoying buzzwords. The whole office would be better without guess what the number one, one on the entire list is ecosystem. Let's see what they have to say about it. Uh, you, you probably recognize this word for science class. It was uh, ecological unit of living organisms was long ago hijacked by Silicon Valley. Um, <laughs> jargonauts, I like that. <laughs> Most of the time they say industry, network, or simply system works just as well. So anyway, um, that that's that's good stuff. Dis disruption. Oh, Alan wants to know. The other words, Alan, I've only banned a few. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to ban a whole bunch of them because I think it starts to lose meaning. I banned blockchain. Um, blockchain's on like a long-term temporary ban until 
there's a live production use case to talk about, in which case, if people refer to it in the context of a live production use case at scale, then it can be used. Um, of course, it can be used in a cryptocurrency context, but that's sort of a weird exception because we don't talk about cryptocurrency on this show. Uh, so it's blockchain. Um, seamless integration was just banned today. I think that's a permanent ban because I don't think integration is ever going to be seamless. So I don't see how that could ever be unbanned. And then um, the third is ecosystem. I just, I've, I think I've heard that word like 50 times in the last two weeks on keynotes and I'm, I'm, I'm all done with it. I'm all done with it. Uh, disruption's pretty bad. I, I try not to use disruption too much. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, I use it when I'm just, when I'm on disrupt TV, but that's only because they call it disrupt TV. And I like to tell them that I'm going to disrupt it if they invite me, but that's, that's not quite the same, right? Um, okay. Let's just look at the rest on this list. Ideations number two. I'm not a fan of that word, but I don't see it being used very much. Leverage is number three. I, I said on Twitter today, I've been I managed to mostly purge the word leverage from my vocabulary. I totally agree. It's just, it's, I'm not banning it on the show, but it's like, it's just a tedious, pretentious word to use. Uh, I think we might need to be careful about using outcomes, the word outcome too much. I don't think I'm not going to ban it, but I would put that on the list. Ah, disrupts on this list too. Number five, this is a pretty good list. Bandwidth is number four. Uh, when, so when someone tells me they don't have the bandwidth to take on that project. Uh, that's pretty good. Double click. Wow, dog food's been coming up a lot. Going to have to eat our own dog food. Um, iterate. Yeah, that's that's tedious. Iterative and stuff like that. Rockstar, Wizard, Ninja Guru. Yeah, totally. Probably put Thought Leader on there. Like, really, you know, if someone, like, if I'm thinking to have someone on the show and they have Thought Leader on their profile, then I don't invite them. You should never describe yourself as a Thought Leader. Alan says we should use outcomes more. It's really all that matters. Yeah, I think I think it does, but I think we got to mix it up. Right, because we could talk about things like results, um, you know, or or what it, you know, what did you get out of it, or even occasionally we could talk about ROI. Um, yeah, you know, I think we have to mix it up. I, I just think out, we're in danger of overusing outcomes. Is all. Bonnie doesn't like growth hacker. Yeah, yeah, growth growth hacker is pretty. That's pretty brutal. Oh, here's the most hated tech buzzwords of 2021 from Trust Radius. So this is all current. Let's see what they have to say. Uh, Zoom. Well, yeah, AI. See, I, I think like that's tough because like AI is what it is, right? I mean, we we've grown to use AI in kind of a fairly generic way, but I think at least we understand each other when we use it. Uh, disrupts on this list, synergy, cloud, digital transformation, pivot, big data, virtual and agile, agile. Interesting. People hate the use of words. Zoom is a verb. They're saying, yeah, I, I guess I could see that. Yeah, this this list doesn't really do it for me, but I know I know what they're talking about with with synergy though. I mean, you know, I, I probably couldn't like do business with someone who used the word synergy a lot. So I can see where they're coming from there. But thought leader is a very tired one, says a writ, and growth growth hacker is an awful one. <laughs> growth hacker is pretty brutal. We're going to have to actually have you on the program. If you keep this up, we'll just 
get you on here one of these Fridays and you can give us your full list. Brian doesn't like semantic influencer topology, totology, and any ology as a service. <laughs> I think I will be leveraging blockchain when I retire. Well, actually, the idea is to leverage blockchain now so that you can retire on your cryptocurrency investments. AI is abused and really in most cases it's not real AI. Yeah, I, I think so, but but I also think that like that 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 horse is so far out of the barn and it's never coming back in the barn. And I think most people understand that that the term is tossed around and it doesn't always really mean what it means. But but at least like the way it's used now, people understand that it doesn't have anything to do with general intelligence and ET and stuff like that, or the Terminator. At least people understand that it's more, um, you know, it's just the question of how intelligent are your systems really, right? And a lot of AI stuff is rules-based engines and stuff like that. But I think at least people have some general idea that the term is broadly used. I don't know if it's like to eradicate it from vocabularies it's just, ne just never going to happen. So it's not realistic. It'd be like crying about the fact that it snows in Massachusetts in the winter. Uh, sprinkle some big data on your digital transformation for better outcomes. That feels almost like a few years ago in a way, like I thought we were sort of beyond big data, but yeah, Alan, it was on the 21 list along with digital transformation for better, better outcomes. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting too with digital transformation, right? Because, you know, isn't it really about business transformation? I mean, at some point, like, like digital is sort of understood and, and digital in itself is, is not enough. Uh, interesting. I think there's at least one person in the chat who's written a book about that. So, okay. A um, few more, the 12, oh, that's, that's just ad tech. I'm going to find a few more. How about if I look at um, 2012? Let's see if the worst bud words from 2012. Let's see how many of them are still kicking around. Interesting. They're all pretty much gone away. 2012, there was hacktivist. That's pretty bad. Uh, crowdfunding was big. Programmer. Nice. <laughs> Nice program, <laughs> programmer. Ouch. Ouch. Oh, here's one from 2019. 21 most annoying tech buzzwords. Let's see. Pivot made number one on this list. Yeah, Pivot is really bad. I don't know how the people in this group feel, but I think Pivot's like, one one of the worst. I just I cringe whenever I hear it. Pivot pivot is tough. Three hundred sixty degree view is number two. Ouch. Yeah, three hundred sixty. We we've covered that in the show actually. Uh, in a Thomas Weber edition. Three disrupt. Yeah. Four is actionable insights. Ouch. Wow, that's going to screw some people up if they're not allowed to say that. Ooh, actionable insights. Interesting. I like this. This list is good because they're they're kind of saying what to say instead and what you really mean. That's 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 really helpful to help people learn how to speak um, English again. I'll post the link. You may be able to see it on your feed there. So in the case of actionable insights, this is what to say instead. It says, from this customer survey, we learned specific ways in which we could alter our strategy. And then it says, what you really mean, this data told us how to change our approach. Nice, basic English. Uh, number five is sync up. Number six is holistic approach. I heard someone earlier today on my Twitter feed, they said, um, they said they're trying to not say holistic as much. Yeah, because holistic is... Is pretty tough. What to say instead? We consider all the ways the development plays off and affects each other, even the ones that may appear less significant. That's kind of wordy, though. What you really mean, we look at the big picture. Uh, number seven is leverage. Ouch. Yeah, leverage came up again. 
what uh, what to say instead. We're going to outsource some tasks. Uh, so just keep it simple. Number eight, open the kimono. I kind of like that one. Number nine, circle back. Circle back is brutal. I get that in my inbox all the time, PR people. Number 10 is deep dive. Number 11 is visibility. Number 12 is core competency. I feel like I feel like core competency's kind of gone out of style. That's probably for the best. Uh, buy-in is 13 on this list. 14 is growth hacking. Bonnie, you made it. Growth hacking. As in he's an expert in growth hacking on for social media. Ouch. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. Uh, as in he's basically like impossible to work with because he's like infatuated with stuff that doesn't matter. Uh, what to say instead. Oh, I love this. Check this out, Bonnie. It says what you really mean. So, okay. So, so the, the sentence is he's expert in growth hacking for social media. And what you really mean is we're going to try, we're going to try things until something works. I love that. That's perfect. Silos. I don't really mind silos that much. It doesn't maybe uh, know if it bothers any of you guys. Uh, hustle. I don't really see that being abused too much. Digital transformation. Um, overused. Agile is on this list. Bandwidth. Wow, bandwidth is coming up a lot. I, I don't really run into that too much. It's cheesy as hell, but I don't really run into... Like, do people say that? I don't have the bandwidth for that. That's really corny. Number 20 is innovation. I, I, I try not to use the word innovation at all. I don't think I'd ban it from the show, but it's just such a bland word. Bonnie says he's a real influencer. Yeah. I mean, inf influencer is, is a really, is a, is a super cheese ball one. Um, Efforting, very.com boom, efforting. Yeah, efforting. Some of the verbs, Alan, are definitely like when you verbify certain things, it definitely get, gets you onto a list like this. And then um, 21 is unicorn. All right, I'll do one more and then I'm going to going to call it for the day. Let's let's find one more. The worst tech jargon of 2020. Let's see. I find it interesting there's a lot of commonality. Uh <laughs> Oh, a uh, preneur. It's like a suffix. Bolt any word in front of this. Someone styling themselves. Like, so they use the example of like burger printer, uh, menu printer. If you describe yourself as an entrepreneur, you probably aren't. Um, circle back, reach out, revert all hands on deck and pivot. Uh, Essentially, a tech Pilates session of terrible words and phrases. Unicorn made this list. Uh, going through, a uh, thought leader made the list. Oh, and um, and then another one on this list is uh, servitization. Ah, oh, that's 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 one that does come up sometimes. I know. Brian, I know you have some feelings about servitization. Uh, it can definitely be it could definitely be overhyped. That's for sure. Um, be, that's an interesting one as far as like one of those where you have to then figure out what the alternatives would be to describe it. Um, <laughs> it says uh, revolutionize the digital transformation. Indeed. Yeah, I, th I think a Ritz earning or a earning a guest invite on the, the show. Keep it up. going to have to bring you in and we can talk about consumption-based pricing. Keep those lively Friday afternoons running. Yeah, I will, man. I This this one was just a little more seat of the pants than, than usual, but I appreciate you uh, having some fun with me anyhow. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for, for joining the more spontaneous thing. Um, hopefully, in the next coming weeks around this time, I'll have some 
really interesting, compelling guests for you, but it does take me a little while to get them lined up and prepped. So that's, that's why sometimes it hasn't been happening lately, but it will. So have a great evening. Thanks for giving me your buzzwords of choice. Really enjoyed that. Later.